Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I, my name is Sarah. I'm a PhD student at Johns Hopkins. Before that, I got my undergraduate degree at Georgetown, and then I worked in science policy in DC for a couple of years. Um, I'm going to let each panelist introduce themselves, and then we'll move into discussion. So Richard, would you like to kick it off? Thank you. I'm uh, Richard Howard. I'm a graduate student at American Public University System in uh, Space Studies and um, with a concentration in aerospace science. And I am a um, student leader in a couple of organizations. I'm uh, president of the um, APIS SEDS chapter, my second year as president. And I'm uh, vice chair of the uh, newly formed APIS AIAA chapter. So, um, and um, I also volunteer for uh, the National Space Society. I'm involved with them, space advocacy too different organizations. Um, okay, and um, that's it for Carl? me. Hi, good morning. I'm Carl Starr. Uh, let's see, I uh, previously in the late 90s, uh, from then on, I had spent some time in the military, about 12 years uh, in the Army. Um, in 2000, I uh, formed an engineering company and ran that for 13 years. And then uh, in 2014, uh, NASA hired me to be the uh, JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope Mission Operations Manager. And uh, so currently I serve in that position uh, for the last six years. And, uh, and I am a graduate of AMU as well. I completed my master's uh, in space studies um, uh, early last year. So almost a couple years now. Ed? Awesome. Ed? Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ed Albin, and I am the program director for space studies at the American Public University and uh, thanks so much for joining us in our open discussion session uh, this morning. I'm also an assistant professor with the university and have been with AMU um, since uh, 2011 and program director since 2016. Uh, currently co coordinate uh, uh, 50 plus faculty and close to 65 courses dedicated to space studies and earth sciences. Uh, earlier this year, our program expanded to include earth sciences. Uh, so that is one of our new concentrations in uh, space in earth studies is we're sort of now, now calling it um, uh, however, our, our major and ongoing concentrations include aerospace science, astronomy, space policy, and a new concentration that we're going to launch uh, mid next year, space entrepreneurship. I uh, Just a little bit of personal background. I'm in the Atlanta area. Uh, however, I, I do operate an observatory. Uh, this is about 120 miles east of Atlanta in the Deer Lick Astronomy Village. There are about two dozen of us who have observatories out there. And in my, my talk later today, I'll be sharing some images and some of the work that um, I'm, I'm doing out that way. Uh, I'm also uh, director of the APUS Observatory. We, we have uh, 24 inch plane wave uh, robotic observatory that we integrate in the curriculum. Um, I, I've been a, a space enthusiast all, all of my life uh, growing up during the Apollo era. That's really what what got me started. Uh, I completed a master's degree at Arizona State University in the 80s uh, in planetary science and a PhD in the 90s from the University of Georgia Planetary Geology. Uh, my expertise is in uh, the geology of the moon, Mars, asteroids, and also meteorites, uh, geochemistry of, of meteorites. All right, <laughs> it's probably more than you wanted to know, but welcome to our session today. And I guess I'll, I'll hand it off to Dimitri. Hi, good morning. My name is Dmitry Bizev. Uh, I'm an astronomer. I work as a deputy lead astronomer 
at the Apache Poet Observatory in the mountains of New Mexico. Uh, and here we mostly conduct the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. I, I have a hope that I will introduce it to you later. Uh, so I also teach uh, introductory classes at New Mexico State University as, as an adjunct professor. And I joined uh, APUS in, I guess, 2012. And since that time, I teach astronomy and physics courses uh, as, uh, well, we, we ask to introduce ourselves as part-time faculty. Yeah, part-time faculty. <laughs> so, yep, that's my introduction. Awesome, thank you. Um, Ed, I know you had a presentation. Do you want to start with that? And then if anyone else wants to... Well, uh, the actually the presentation is for um, the 11.30 No, program. I want to see all the observatories, Ed. <laughs> oh, okay. I can... Um, no, no, do it. Do what you want. Do what you want. I'm just joking. Okay. Around. Yeah, yeah. Let me just say a few things and um, um, a, a bit of uh, introduction um, to... Uh, our program and and uh, what really is an exciting time in the uh, field of aerospace and aer uh, space sciences. Um, we I, I think our it, it was mentioned yesterday by one of the speakers, um, I believe from NASA, JD Polk, that we're at a a tipping point in the um, exploration of space. And I know, I know Carl Sagan and many, many of us from the 70s, late 70s, um, when I was in high school, uh, were inspired by Carl Sagan and Cosmos. Um, and Carl would say that at that time that we lived in the golden age of planetary exploration. And I think he was absolutely correct at, at, at the time uh, in terms of the robotic exploration of, of the solar system. I, I can recall um, it, when, when I was in high school, the Voyager spacecraft um, were launched on a journey to explore the outer solar system. And this was about at the time of, of Cosmos, the Cosmos series. Um, and I think was part of what inspired Carl Sagan, as well as, as us, but Carl was inspired to produce Cosmos based on the fact that we were sending probes to Mars and to the outer solar system. So in uh, 77, 78, when Voyager 1 and 2 launched, I was in high school. Okay, when, when the flyby of the Voyager spacecraft of um, Jupiter and then Saturn, that happened in the early 80s. I, I was an undergraduate and um, that was very inspirational. Um, I, was, I was an astronomy student, undergrad astronomy physics major, but I, I have to say that following Voyager and especially the exploration of the, the moons of uh, Jupiter and Saturn uh, convinced me that I really was into planetary science, planetary geology, that, and, and as well as uh, going back to my days as, as a kid, watching the astronauts walk on, on the moon <laughs> that, that rekindled that interest in planetary science. And so I pursued a, a master's degree in planetary science, planetary geology at Arizona State University. And following the, the Voyager thing, it was in um, uh, 19, um, well, actually, um, yeah, the, in 1989, that uh, the Voyager 2 flew by Neptune. So, um, in, in my career, it was interesting. And, and then I transitioned into uh, a position uh, more so in science education 
and astronomy education with a couple of major planetariums in, in Louisiana and, and um, uh, Atlanta. This is how I ended up in Atlanta with the Fern Bank Science Center and, and Museum of Natural History. And it, it's amazing now as program director of, of uh, space studies, I, I continue to monitor the Voyagers, which are still sending information from uh, the beyond the outskirts of our of our solar system. So back then, uh, way back then, was truly the the golden age of robotic space pro probe exploration. And I wanted to say now that um, we are reconfiguring to return astronauts to deep space. We, we have the capability with the um, NASA's space launch system, the big equivalent to the Saturn V and the Orion spacecraft with our Artemis mission, who Artemis, by the way, was Apollo's sister in Greek mythology. And Apollo, the, the Apollo missions that inspired so many of us, I think Gene Cernan, um, uh, the, as, as he says, the last man on the moon in December of 1972 really framed it well. He, he was very articulate and said it, it was almost like Apollo was pulled out of the 21st century and stuck in the 20th century somewhere in, in the 60s. It, it, it was so out of place that we could do that which unfortunately <laughs> led to a lot of conspiracy theories that, oh, we never went to the moon because how could we do this? We didn't even have Zoom capability or, or um, <laughs> cell phones, microcomputers. You know, how in the world did we do that? But we did, and it was amazing. It shows what, what great things humanity can do. And so that, that was... Um, an oddity, Apollo was an oddity of <clears throat> the, the 20th <clears throat> century, but I think it foretold what will happen in the 21st century, what, what I like to call, we're, we're at the beginning of the golden age of human exploration of, of the solar system. Returning to the moon, <clears throat> <clears throat> we're witnessing, <clears throat> excuse me, a uh, confluence of, of um, uh, government, commercial, and military operations in space with the government, uh, the United States government in conjunction with ESA, European Space Agency, with our Artemis mission, space launch system, uh, big rockets designed to go to the moon and eventually to Mars, but the moon is NASA's major focus at the moment commercial uh, space industry, um, human space flight. Um, and, and by the way, Artemis we sh is scheduled to land the first woman on the moon <laughs> in 2024, which is totally exciting and, and great. So our, our first crew will have um, uh, women, scientists, engineers, pilots ex exploring the moon, which is long overdue. We, um, <clears throat> this uh, commercial space industry, notably SpaceX, um, <clears throat> many of us, including myself, have been down to watch. It's one of the nice things about living in Atlanta <clears throat> is um, that uh, it, it's only an eight hour drive to the Space Coast. And uh, I was planning on going down for the, uh, the crew launch uh, the Falcon 9 <coughs> Dragon to the space station that was supposed to happen on the 31st of this month, uh, but it's been postponed to December. But to witness those launches and the, also the Falcon Heavy, and I'm really excited about Starship. Um, Elon Musk 
is producing, as, as we know, this giant spacecraft that is designed uh, to carry passengers to the moon. Uh, it, it really is an interplanetary uh, space vehicle that can go to the moon, Mars, uh, perhaps moons of Jupiter and Saturn uh, to take humanity elsewhere in, into, into our solar system. So this is, this is really, really exciting. And then of course, in terms of the military, the space force um, in the 21st century, uh, the new space force, I believe the infrastructure of the military will really help get things moving. They can be a catalyst their organizational structure. And, and this, of all people, Carl Sagan, back in the 70s, advocated that the military should be involved. Although he was very much a pacifist, uh, he thought space exploration is an ideal mission for the military to lead the way. And a good example is Captain Cook and the ex exploration of the Earth. He would take scientists, engineers, um, historians on board, uh, philosophers uh, on, on his ships to explore uh, the world, the, the new world. And, and so we're, we will, I think, see the same with the military. Uh, we'll have future Captain Cooks taking us out, out into the solar system. So anyway, I just wanted to, to frame that, that we're as director of space studies and a space enthusiast <laughs> since I was about this big. Um, this is a very, very exciting time. Um, I was a little disappointed in the 70s because I thought, oh, I missed the grand exploration of the moon and all the cool things that are happening. But now is the happening time. And we're so thrilled to have our students uh, highly motivated and excited about the happenings in space today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree, with, uh, Dr. Elvin. Um, the, uh, the 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 vast um, wide area of opportunities for students, space students, and space studies, and aerospace students. Um, it's just compared to the seventies. You know, it was, you know, mainly everything was government run and and. The opportunities weren't there, but now you know with co with commercial, with these commercial companies like SpaceX, Blue Origin, and and the military and the Space Force, uh, we have all these resources, vast resources, that combine can fill in the gaps, enhance where the other where something's lacking in the you know the the, um, the federal the commercial, you know especially supply you know for long distance uh, spacecraft uh, be able to get to the moon. Um, you know, the Starship has two versions of these. He's got the, the moon version of the Starship, um, SpaceX, and the Mars version. So, and it's a heavy, um, it's capable of uh, transporting a large amount of cargo and, 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 you know, astronauts so that we can have a variety of ability to transport cargo and humans to, a, if we, you know, so we can have a sustained uh, settlement on the moon. And and also to try to build a, some kind of a settlement on Mars. Um, plus, with the you know, we also need to use the moon for to develop our technology to go to Mars, uh, especially with different kind of propulsion systems like a nuclear uh, thermal, which NASA wants to develop and the military does too. And so, we do need uh, the advancement of you know systems advancement of uh, propulsion systems, power systems. Um, there's, you know, even working on fusion. I saw some news on fusion recently on space.com that uh, the advances in high temperature um, um, magnets, instead of uh, which are can generate high high powerful magnetic fields, but at higher temperatures, so they can lower the size of, of potential uh, fusion reactors, so they can generate a sustained fusion reaction at a lower price and smaller size. And if they could do that. They can um, possibly put it in outer space around the moon. We could have maybe possibly a fusion power on the moon in the future. They, they say maybe 20, 20 years from now, if they're predicting. Um, I saw a thing on 
um, metallic fusion um, using uh, rare earth metals and in, in um, deuterated uh, whatever rare earth metals and uh, they actually have, they think they might have um, witnessed uh, fusion um, using metals. So it's, you know, which is a different approach than the, like the Tokamak reactors and things like that. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think uh, we need we need partnerships, you know, especially the Artemis Accords, of course, we've all seen recently that have happened, uh, where NASA's, you know, the Artemis Accords signing up with the uh, different space agencies around the world and countries, and we're we gotta we gotta put everything together because it's a worldwide effort in order to really get this done to effective exploration and settlement of space and utilization of uh, the resources of the solar system. Carl, do you want to um, talk about the answer that you just gave Kristen in the Q and A? Oh, uh, sure. Let's see. Um... I think the question was, uh, you know, let's see, I'll read it here. In my opinion, what's the factor that will make Artemis a sustained human exploration effort when it continues to the solar system, you know, as opposed to Apollo just began on the moon. And I, I my reply was, you know, I, th I think it's really as simple as th this is how we're starting out. And, and typically when you design a system, um, a large system, you, you, you tend to kind of keep that original design going. So if humans are designed into it, really hard to, de to design them out of it later. Um, kind of what I was also going to add to what Ed and Richard were saying is uh, there's all the partnerships and all the big endeavors and it's a very exciting time for our industry. But one thing I think that often gets overlooked is um, you need people to, to manage these efforts and to put these missions together to plan, to strategic plan. Um, and so again, when you're when you're talking about those kinds of skill sets and the people aspect of these efforts, uh, you, you can kind of see why I answered the question that way. So if we if we start sending and designing spacecraft and rockets and uh, modules and transfer stations, and we do all this with the humans in mind, granted it'd be humans and robots together, but once you start that effort, uh, it, it'll be sustained. It, it'll just continue, and then from there, like Dr. Alban said, you know, you, the idea is to keep reaching further into the solar system and keep projecting ourselves out. Um, audience, uh, obviously feel free to post in the Q&A or in the chat, we're looking at both. Um, but just to kick things off, I'm wondering if any of you panelists wanna talk about a project that you're working on right now that you're particularly excited about and obviously why. Well, I, I, I can say, um, so I'm pretty excited. Uh, I'm, as I had mentioned before, I'm the mission operations manager of the mom for JWST. And so we're basically a year from launch now, finally. And uh, it's pretty exciting. What's interesting though, is, is we, you know, we're, we're kind of doing it in the middle of a pandemic. So um, it, it's presented a lot of challenges for us as part of the conversation I'm going to have at the, uh, at the other session, session five, I believe. Um, but, but it is exciting. We're, we're, we're finishing building it. We've completed all the, the latest environmental tests and uh, we, we are in three weeks in three weeks, we're starting our official launch rehearsal campaign, which uh, simulates all the early parts of launch and early parts of commissioning that we do to ready the telescope for science operations. Uh, so I'm pretty excited. There's a lot going on, uh, very dynamic. It's, uh, uh, we've got about, it's a, it, the team is a little over 600 people. We've got about 94 nationals that participate and, uh, and then the rest are spread out amongst the country. They, they come from uh, Northrop Grumman out in California, Ball Aerospace in Colorado, JPL's involved. Um, and then of course the local area here. So I'm um, pretty excited. If anybody has any questions about the James Webb telescope, you know, I can certainly talk about that, see how it applies to the, to the session here, but certainly, yeah, very exciting times. Very happy about it. Hey, Sarah, I can, I can say a little bit about <clears throat> some of the ongoing research <clears throat> that we're um, doing with the yes, American Public University uh, 
telescope um, in uh, Charlestown, West Virginia. We have, uh, it sits beneath a 30 foot dome um, on the IT building. And if you're ever in Charlestown, folks, uh, let me know. Although I'm based in Atlanta, I can coordinate with folks there, uh, students and other <coughs> folks, researchers who are interested in seeing the facility, I can coordinate with them to let you take a look. Uh, we have a beautiful 24-inch um, plane wave telescope that um, we use to, to uh, view the sky. In fact, let me see. I will actually share uh, an image and um, our observatory website, which has uh, some pictures, uh, images that were taken um, through the telescope. <coughs> and, um, oops, uh, let's see, let me pull that up. <laughs> uh, there we go. Let's see if I can share that with you. Let me come back here. Um, all right. There we go. Okay, can everybody everybody see our our wonderful uh, observatory? Um, uh, that's a picture of me making uh, an adjustment to to the equipment. The marvelous <coughs> thing about our observatories we're, we're one of the few online observatories uh, that operates an, a robotic telescope. I can, uh, from my office here in Atlanta, I can power up uh, the telescope and the dome. Uh, the desktop computer, we use um, Microsoft Desktop uh, to essentially turn your home computer and myself and other faculty and students, it's like sitting at the control center of of the observatory where we're operate it's no different than sitting next to the telescope and operating the um, telescopes um, computer <laughs> right there whether you're sitting at home or, or in Australia or wherever you you can <coughs> control control the observatory um, on on the uh, right side of the screen uh, this is an image I took of the IT building uh, at the American Public University, and you can just see the top of the dome, the 30, it's a 33 foot dome. And <clears throat> let's see, we have a <clears throat> there down below uh, a better view of the telescope, a 24 inch. It has a mirror two feet across. That's um, <clears throat> that it's like an eyeball aimed at the sky. Uh, of course, the slit opens, the, the telescope points very accurately, and we have a couple of um, S-Big cameras, uh, digital cameras, very, very sensitive cameras uh, attached to the telescope. One is, <clears throat> you can see at the end of the main telescope here, by the way, telescope weighs close to 400 pounds, so it's counterbalanced with all these, these weights on an equatorial mount. Uh, we also have a five inch uh, stellar view um, refractor, very nice refractor uh, with another digital camera. And we're <clears throat> this gives us a very wide field of view and the 24 inch telescope provides a, a narrow, narrow field of view <clears throat> for, for looking at, at the sky. Ed, can and we, there you can see. Ed, can we, can we yeah. talk about what student projects are being run on the telescope? Yeah, definitely, definitely so. And um, in fact, uh, there's some images going by. Here we go. <laughs> Good point there. Uh, <clears throat> some of the ongoing research, uh, Dr. Kristen Miller, Associate Professor in Space Studies 
uh, who is with us um, in our meeting today as, as I should have invited her on the panel. She's sort of the lead observatory astronomer for us here at APUS. She's coordinating a supernova uh, search program where we image <clears throat> on a clear night, we, we can image dozens of galaxies and those images are stored in a database that is accessible by students. <clears throat> and so they compare the most recent image with a reference image to see if um, a supernova, an exploding star has happened in another galaxy. Uh, another one of our uh, assistant professors, David Syndergaard, is uh, working with <clears throat> students on a variable star research project, um, submitting data to, I, I believe, Lyrid, our, our variable stars, and also um, other variable stars, <laughs> um, in, including the so-called um, um, Tammy star, the interesting star that we're, we're not quite sure why it drops in brightness o over time. One, one idea was there was uh, uh, a sphere created by uh, an advanced civilization, but I believe it's uh, debris is, is drifting, uh, uh, comets are drifting past the star occasionally, but we've been looking at that particular star for some time <clears throat> and submitting data to the American Association of, of Variable Stars. Um, okay, I see Kara has a question. How can you get involved with astronomy and the telescope projects research if you're currently in aerospace masters, uh, science masters concentration? Definitely so, uh, Kara. Um, just re re reach out to me or, or Kristen Miller. And if you'd like to, we're, we're actually soliciting <laughs> for students to help us in our supernova research uh, or search efforts. And we can, we can definitely get you underway there. <clears throat> that, that's a, a good introduction to the telescope and the imagery that we have. Um, one, one project that I'm very interested in, and I'm working with Dr. Miller and also uh, uh, Caitlin Milliman, Dr. Milliman, on is uh, exoplanet transit photometry. Even though we're in Charlestown, West Virginia with the telescope, you can see some of the, the wonderful images <laughs> drifting by. I'll pull those down so you can get a better look at them. Um, the light pollution is pretty bad. However, uh, photometry is still possible and easily done. Um, <clears throat> with with the telescope, and there's a beautiful picture of the comet Neowise that put on a good show this past summer. Um, so exoplanet photometry, mostly follow-up observations of exoplanets, uh, the Kepler mission. Uh, there's so much much data, and uh, the test mission new 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 data coming in to they're discovering crazy amount of exoplanets 4000 planets around other stars um, that we're particip uh, that what we'd like to do and we're beginning to do is participate in follow up observations to nail down the orbital period of these um, planets around stars so we're we're observing as a, a planet drifts across a star, it's basically an eclipse. There's a drop in brightness. And although it may only be uh, one or two percent, um, our instrument is is capable of picking that up. Let's Ed, see. Are there plans for publications based on these observations? Yes, ab absolutely. Um, uh, we, we have submitted publications to the American Astronomical Society at their conferences. I presented on um, re ongoing research in student education with, with our telescope. Um, 
Kristen and Dave Syndergaard faculty have presented <coughs> uh, papers at other conferences. Uh, I know Dave has presented um, variable star photometric data and interpretations at the uh, American uh, uh, the Variable Star Association. So we're, 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 you know, students have an opportunity to participate in, in actual, actual research. Yeah, Dave, uh, uh, if I could, for a second, Dave uh, and Melanie Krausen, who's a recent graduate of, of APA, she uh, and Dave presented her for um, both at the APSO, the uh, Association of Variable Observers, and um, Melly was made a, um, a um, for the, uh, I think it was an ambassador for the EFSO organization and plus uh, her research. She's, uh, she's also uh, recently um, gotten an uh, employment with uh, the uh, Perry um, um, Observatory uh, Complex and Education Complex. I think it's South Carolina or North Carolina. I'm not sure which one. Yeah, that's North North Carolina, and I was there with my wife a few years ago. The Pishka Astronomical Research Institute, which specializes in radio astronomy, and part of Melanie's. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Richard. Melanie's thesis was to uh, collect radio radio uh, uh, radio astronomical observations of various celestial objects, which she is now a uh, program educator uh, director at, at the center. And yes. she's currently working with us in, in trying to set up an optical telescope at Perry. And so we're coordinating with her uh, on a NSF grant. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. That is one of our, our, our um, highly motivated, exceptional students who yes. is moved on to do well. She was also president of our uh, APSS chapter, and she was also vice chair of the SEDS USA um, for one year. Um, so she's, like I said, she's highly motivated and she's helped our chapter, our SEDS chapter, our university, and uh, she's, she go get her. <laughs> Very good hey, what she does. Hey. Hey, Richard, um, Kristen Miller, Dr. Miller is asking, would you like to talk a little bit about the AIAA observing project that you all are initiating? It, it, it's in the early stages, but it is, uh, as she says in the chat uh, or in the question area, it's a very exciting project. Yes, um, I didn't, I'm not really prepared for it, but our, our chapter, our APUS AIAA chapter is, um, going to be utilizing the APUS uh, telescope and uh, uh, Dr. I mean, Professor Dale Wallace um, is, is one of basically, and you spearheaded this um, uh, project where we're going to be uh, using the telescope at APUS and um, MATLAB, which we're going to be getting familiar with if we're not familiar with it. I'm not familiar with it right now. And um, um, SDK, I, th I think that's the uh, company that uh, um, for oral mechanics, um, we're, we're going to be using the telescope to observe orbiting, um, and, you know, I, I think it's near Earth objects or, or satellites and, you know, orbiting, utilizing the, um, the um, information from the telescope combined with um, converting that into oral mechanics uh, calculations using MATLAB and we're going to be um, certain we're going to be whatever obviously we are going to observe um, and to, to um, actually um, get their orbital coordinates the uh, the uh, different coordinates of the orbits um, so um, which is going to be very interesting we're just starting that and we're going to you know see how many you know, I'm signing up for it, and you know, a few others, and how many people get you know involved with it, and um, which will give us you know experience in different things uh, using the telescope, um, um, and uh, you know, visual telescope, and also MATLAB and and uh, software and and orbital mechanics, 
um, science of it and the equations and how to use software to, take, to combine the oral mechanics and the telescope coordinates. So it's it looks it looks very interesting, and uh, I've taken uh, oral mechanics already, and when I got my bachelor's degree in space studies, and I also have a course coming up in a, in a few months in, with a master's program in oral mechanics. So combined with the project, so there's going to be a lot of oral mechanics work I'll be I'll be doing, it, and it'll be a great experience, and you know hopefully we'll be uh, we'll come up with a paper, we'll present the you know the findings and. And um, to the, uh, well, um, maybe different uh, AIAA or, or some other, you know, publications. Um, we also have this, the CESA uh, journal that we have the uh, Space Education and Science, um, uh, Space Education and Strategic Applications Journal, which is a recent publication put out by APOS coming with the policy studies organization and um, comes out twice a year. So maybe we can publish in that um, too. I, I don't know how long uh, the, the project will go, but do you have anything to add to that, Dr. Elvin? I'm, uh... Yeah, ab absolutely, um, Richard. And that, that's very good information, but the, SESA journal is is an excellent um, uh, source for publication of such projects. This is a a APUS journal and um, has the same title as our our conference this this week. And we're always looking for contributors, um, especially students who who would like to write. Um, and talk about research or other things it, um, can be popular articles on on the exploration of space and right writing on the the coattails of what what you're saying with the exciting um, club project uh, in orbital mechanics um, for uh, AI AA, uh, my talk uh, following this today um, is related to syn synthetic tracking of asteroids, not um, <clears throat> satellites. And, and I know you guys are uh, primarily interested in look looking at satellites, but there's also been some discussion of um, uh, near, especially near Earth asteroids. And what, what I'm looking at now are mainly main belt asteroids. So that um, is something, and and uh, I'm going to work with uh, Dr. Miller in terms of presenting at, at an upcoming AI AA meeting. Uh, how, how we can uh, or, or piggyback the project that I'm currently working on with, with the pro the exciting project that you mentioned, Richard. Okay, um, uh, Dimitri is asking a question. Uh, um, to me, just out of curiosity, why am I using or we're using MATLAB that is not free? Um, doc, uh, uh, Professor Wallace was able to um, get it so that we have free access of use of MATLAB. I, <laughs> I'm not sure how he did it, but so I'm not, we're, we're getting free use of it, the students involved in the project. So um, that's great. It is. It isn't free. So that's uh, um, it's just which is wonderful because um, uh, with these are important tools. You you really can't do any real you know equations, mathematical research effectively in you know in large numbers of data and information without the without this kind of software. And you know I come from the old school back. You know I'm a my got my associates back in 1983. So back then we barely had, you know, we had calculators. I'm not sure if we had much of, we had scientific calculators. I finally got a scientific calculator myself around, I don't know, 2002 or 2001. Uh, we, back then we didn't have any, well, actually when I graduated, we didn't have any uh, internet or anything. We had mainframes, um, calculators, simple calculators, and you, you had to go to a separate building to get your, you know, you worked on a, a dummy terminal or use cards or something punch cards and he went to another building with it wrapped up and 
rubber bands or punch cards, and then they turn it into a program. They print it out in a sheet of paper, and then they hand it to you a day later. That was that was rough, <laughs> and we didn't have all these advanced softwares and the internet and any, all the stuff that it's common now that I have access to that makes my space education, my degree program, enjoyable and doable. I didn't have back in the early '80s, which kind of probably affected why it took me a while to, uh, you know, I, outside of this, I've, you know, professionally, I've been a, a drummer and drum teacher for 40 years, and and I'd, um, I also work with special ed as, a, as an aide, but I, these these tools and opportunities, online college and all this, I didn't have, and and when I, I started working with online college back in uh, 2002, when I was just starting to get you know, decent. Of course, you had the, I forgot, it was Windows 95 or Windows XP. The, the operating systems were as uh, dependable as they are now. And you had things crashing all the time. And, and but, you know, it was, I had to get used to online college. And it wasn't as fun as it is now. Now it's with all these operating systems and all the tools and the internet and the email and PDFs and ebooks and everything it's great it's that the, the opportunities are just it's so much more interesting now and and uh, you know even with COVID, and think about COVID-19 with with APUS it hasn't affected us as a university where we just keep going and uh hopefully the other colleges are you know hopefully they can adjust you know I hopefully we'll, we'll you know we'll we'll find some kind of a vaccine or something for this COVID but but this on, online universities and telescopes and all this stuff, we we just keep we're we're plugging along, Apus. <laughs> um, Carl, do you want to comment on opportunities for students or people who were recently yeah. students, or anything like that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I think what the what the other panelists are saying is, you know, there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of things for students to get interested in, and and what can you do. Um, I, I think one, one thing to, you know, one, one thing would be for students to just be interested in something else other than just school, because going out for a job after you get your degree is, is, um, they look at your degree as fundamentals and the basics that you need to know. But now what's happening with the workforce is they're looking at, well, what else do you know? Richard's talking about MATLAB. Um, other people use C++ for computers code. Um, some people, you know, Python is really big right now. There's Java. And, and what, what you see is that you need all of those skills to stand out. Uh, if you don't have those skills, you, you're in the bucket like everybody else, but you've got to broaden. I think students need to be able to broaden the basics that they're getting from the education and from what they think and, and then start enhancing that. Get a different computer language skill. Um, there's there's things about how uh, at least on like for example on JWST there's large elements that function for the observatory but they're all written in different kind of code. The people on the ground have to make sense out of that. The ground system operates under a, a C++ extended language as its base, but there's but it supports uh, MATLAB and Python and Java and all these other kind of different formats to create tools to make sense out of the data that you get from the observatory. Um, at the Institute, at the Space Telescope Science Institute, the data that they get down, um, there is a standard format for how data comes down from a telescope um, at NASA, but how you, how you make sense out of that data, what do you do with it, and then how do you communicate that are very important. So not only do you, do you need to know technical uh, skills, in addition to you know, what schools is, is offering, but uh, you've got to also be able to communicate you have to be able to organize and make sense out of that data. I think the school does a good, the curriculum at, at APIS for space studies, at least, I can't speak for all of the other um, disciplines out there, but I do know for space studies, it's very regimented. You, you understand how to communicate, how to address your audience, how to take a large amount of data, filter that data, and then communicate that outward. And, and I think that's very important. Um, so what you're hearing is, there's observatories available for you. There's, there's uh, tools. Richard's talking about tools. Dr. Alvin's talking about other opportunities. And I think fundamentally then you've the, you, you must take that, bring it into yourself, enhance it a little bit 
And, uh, and then I, I think that's really what, what will help when people go out there trying to find a job. Uh, we're always hiring, you know, we, I, I, have a, I have a workforce of over 600 people and we are in a constant state of attrition, especially during COVID times and uh, the challenges that result. And, and right now I can tell you that when we look for uh, someone who is going to, going to be a, a responsible engineer for one of the subsystems of JWST, we, we don't necessarily look at, um, you know, have you done that before? We don't, we don't, that's not really a criteria anymore. What we now look at is, well, what kind of things have you done? You know, how have you built on your education? What, you know, uh, do you have anything that's maybe not in this uh, aerospace industry, but maybe you were working with something else that dealt with data or organization or logistics? So it really is a, 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 very, um, a, a very interesting time, uh, but, but I think that's really, I think going forward, I think everybody that wants to get a job or, or build upon what APIS offers, uh, it's at least the space studies program puts you well and above the average person. Uh, and I think from there you can kind of springboard easily into the industry and then just exactly what Richard was saying, continue to uh, grow yourself, you know, your own education. Awesome. Thank you. So a spoiler for Dimitri's presentation later, he'll talk about um, how students aspiring to become obse observatory observational astronomers can get involved. Um, uh, well, uh, to, to be honest, uh, actually, uh, I, I mean a little bit different thing, but I, I, I can try to address this question right here because uh, I, I had students in the class that who really, really, Express their wish to to apply for uh, for observing astronomers, and actually uh, there was even one real example that uh, it was a student, and she she applied to to our job too. Uh, uh, I'd say the main thing uh, that people look at is um, uh, a degree of commitment that. Uh, future observers can really can really can really uh, contribute to to observatories and this is not on only our observatory this is probably every every big project in in the world uh, and unfortunately the first thing people look at is that uh, is is the experience so uh, when, when for example recently we hire uh, a person uh, as a replacement for uh, retiring observer, uh, we we look at experience in observations, and actually the the candidate candidates were ranked by their by their experience. So uh, for APUS students, I I don't see um, a very high level of competition here. I mean I mean uh, to to be a good candidate in this case in this particular case, they they should should earn some some experience in real observations. So I would say uh, it's very good to have a, its own telescope for the university. It's good. It's very good to have its own telescope. Uh, and in this case, uh, students at least in the in the CV they can uh, they can just state this experience that just um, and tell a story about uh, the projects they 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 ran on telescope. Especially if they ran them almost independently, you know, not just taking data from somebody and reduced data, but really, really did the project, it would be a plus. So I, I would, I would recommend this way for students who are curious to do that. Um, but of course, yeah, that's that's not a question for five minutes. Probably <laughs> we can discuss it more and more. Involving, involving at Alban, by the way. <laughs> So we've Thanks got four more minutes if anyone um, has additional things they'd like to say. Oh, actually, we might have 14 more minutes. My bad. Um, um, uh, I'll say, so I have a couple things. Uh, I am uh, I live in uh, Auburn, New York, in Q County, up, uh, central New York State. And um, we have a planetarium, a Sputnik era planetarium that 
uh, we have, um, it's located on a school district um, in um, Aurora, New York. And um, we, it's, uh, I'm involved with a uh, nonprofit that raised money to repair it. it. Needed major repair and the school system gave up. You know, they closed it down because it was pretty bad physical shape. So we raised money and it's been repaired and it has a classroom attached to it for STEM courses for students for robotics. And so I just wanted to um, talk about that a little bit and that uh, the planetarium, uh, we just we got uh, some brand new uh, systems for uh, projection systems and um, software, which, which I'll, I'll receive training on too in the near future. For the planetarium, it's a uh, Southern Cuga Planetarium. It's called Southern Cuga Planetarium in Aurora, New York, and uh, it, um, it's a it's a very nice facility. It's 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 it's, it's an old building, but it was rebuilt, and uh, it has the you know, you know the old fashioned uh, I forgot the name of it uh, projector system, um, but also out back is uh, they have a they built a uh, an observatory which has houses two telescopes so that you they also have viewing nights and you can get experience using real telescopes and you know the viewing up here is not great either you know it's it's not the ideal in you know central new york but uh you know on good nights you can do some good viewing so i do there are opportunities up here to do some you know real telescope um some work and and you know planetariums whatever planetariums there are you know i mean that's another possible job or possible application of a space studies degree is some kind of planetarium job you know the software and and um work with students and uh, sometimes the positions are separate from you know they're just separately from teacher jobs but they're you know they want sometimes they're part-time sometimes they're full-time so i just want to add that um yeah, thanks. <clears throat> thanks so much for for mentioning that. And I'll I'll piggyback <clears throat> uh, my response to to your good information about planetariums to uh, Dimitri's question in the chat area. He's asking about students who graduated, uh, and especially with astronomy concentrations. Um, I'll I'll circle back around to the planetarium. But we, we recent a, a couple of good recent exa examples um, testimonials would be Melanie Croson, that uh, graduate, uh, a recent graduate that was mentioned, who is now the education director at Perry, uh, graduated with a master's degree in uh, with an astronomy concentration, uh, and so she was able to move directly into this this really nice position at Perry in North Carolina. Uh, also Glenn Russ uh, graduated with a uh, master's degree with astronomy concentration. And Glenn is, um, <clears throat> he is also the education director uh, for, for a really cool organization, SLU. Uh, Glenn uh, was very much into telescopes and instrumentation and SLU is an online, very large online um, organization dedicated to remote operation of observatories. So you could submit op operations and actually go right to um, Glenn's desk <laughs> at SLU and he coordinates observations. A very, very slick site that he has set up and there, there are um, hundreds of uh, folks who, who participate, thousands that participate in acquiring images. And uh, it, it is very, very cool uh, what, what kind of um, data you can get, whether it's scientific data or just pretty pictures. If you wanted a picture of, uh, for example, the Great Hercules Cluster, you can submit that through SLU. And so Glenn is, is very happy <laughs> there. So. Um, I, uh, Carl is another, Carl right here, a great example of, uh, an APUS graduate has done well as, um, he is, as, as he has mentioned the, um, the, uh, 
the NASA Missions Operation Manager for the James Webb Space Telescope. And then coming back around to, to planetariums, um, much of my career was spent in a planetarium. And I'm so happy that you mentioned you have a planetarium nearby. And I, with my colleagues, colleagues in the planetarium field, they're always looking for uh, folks knowledgeable and enthusiastic about planetariums. And our curriculum, especially at the undergraduate level, we, we do have a course um, that Dr. Miller developed, Tools of the Planetarium, that will prepare you um, <clears throat> in conjunction with an astronomy concentration to work in the planetarium field. And if you're interested in that sort of thing, take a look at the International Planetarium Society, IPS, International Planetarium Society website. They, they are always posting jobs, as well as some of the regional planetarium websites. Um, SEPA, Southeastern Planetarium Association. There's uh, Rocky Mountain Planetarium Association, Southwest Planetarium Association. And, and there's probably a planetarium near you that you may have visited, but um, <clears throat> It's an ideal opportunity for our students who, <clears throat> whether you have the uh, bachelor's or master's degree in space studies, you, you can be very well qualified to work in a planetarium, which is typically associated with an observatory, as Richard mentioned, and an exciting way to combine your career interest and passion for all things related to space and to make money at what may have been a hobby. Uh, um, and and you, you know, they say if you can turn a hobby into a career, you never work a day in your life. So, so we have, we're, we're down to our last. Uh, Six minutes. And I, I, I do see, Sarah, there looks like there's a question from Sam White. Okay, he mentioned getting involved or soliciting for help from students with potential projects. Where can we find these sol solicitations? Well, we just sent one out. If you're, for example, in, um, the in any of our astronomy courses, current astronomy courses, uh, Dr. Miller and I uh, sent out a notification about our supernova research project with the 24 inch APIS telescope. We, that's a good way to get started, Sam. Uh, you, you can reach out to me or Dr. Miller. Um, uh, I'm E. Albin at apis.edu um, and we can we can get you underway doing some observing there. Um, the Supernova Research Project is, is a great introduction to the telescope and then from there if you like doing that sort of thing you can move on to exoplanet photometry or variable star observations. Good question though. So Kristen, Kristen is saying the team lead researchers monitor Gmail account fre frequently. Okay. Do Chris, Kristen, did you, did you want to expand on that? So sorry, Sarah. No, no, I was going to um, say I can unmute Kristen if she wants to speak. Oh, that would be great if Kristen wanted to come on board and just say a little bit about sure. <laughs> our, our grand finale. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, awesome. Well, hi. Um, yeah, thanks, Jared. Thanks for letting me come on for a minute. And um, just a quick plug, I'll be talking a lot more about the project in 
um, giving some details about it in my presentation later today. So if you are interested in it all, um, you know, you can come and get a feel for what we're doing in the project and also meet our two lead researchers who are going to have a little cameo to tell us about their role in the project. But um, I just, in the chat, I dropped in our Gmail address. We have um, a Gmail account associated with the project that um, we encourage anyone interested to, um, to, you know, just shoot us an email. Some lead researchers monitor that account and they'll be in contact and let me know. Um, you know uh, right, now I, right now I know there are openings on one of the two research teams. I think one of the teams might be full after our last recruitment drive, but the other team is, I believe, still accepting participants. So if you want to email in, we will uh, get in contact with you and, uh, and see if it will, you know, kind of discuss with you the time commitment and um, what you would be doing and, and move on from there. But we'd, we'd love to have volunteers. We have a, we tend to have a high turnover rate in our research group. So um, as, as uh, Dr. Alvin said, the, uh, you know, it's a great place to start and you get some experience and then um, it's a great way to move on to other projects. And um, so, yeah, come shoot us an email and we'll be in touch with you. Thanks. Thanks, Kristen. That's great. And I, I think the Supernova project is, is, it's sort of a workout uh, and uh, the attrition rate can be high because um, you're, you're really spending a lot of time sifting through lots and lots of images, which is exciting. And, and it, it really is a test of whether you like doing this sort of thing. And for many of us, including myself and you, that's, uh, we love that spending time <laughs> late, burning the midnight oil, <laughs> looking at images with a possible discovery um, of, of an exploding star in another galaxy that, that motivates. And then we have some students who, who just go crazy with it, which, which is awesome. Awesome. So I think it's about that time, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I know some of our panelists have presentations later in the day that will be awesome to check out. And I think um, our contact info all should be available either in the app or on the website.